Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Working Horses with Jim. I am Jim. Get a bear, get a bear, get a bear. Get him, get him, get him. And I am up at Paul Smith's College today, continuing on my log job. I have Bill and Baron with me again this morning, and we'll get these guys hitched up. And I actually have a lot of things I would like to uh, talk to you about. I have a whole bunch of a bunch of stories I even want to tell you. So. Let's get them hitched up and get in the woods and we'll get talking and logging. So today is the day that I hope to have some more students out here as we log here at Palsmith College. So I hope to show you that. Actually, in a little while here, they, the one student should be here, and the teacher, and we'll talk a little bit with him about what's going on. The temperature this morning is like 13 degrees. When I left my house, it was 20 degrees, and my house is at a elevation of a little over uh, 560 feet, I think my phone tells me, and that... When we get up here, the elevation is 1,500 feet. Oh. Oh. Hey. Ha, 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 ha. Oh. Oh. I'm going to stop right here, tie the horses, because I need to go cut some logs, some trees. And I have to have them out of the way, obviously. So we'll get them tied up and then I want to talk about a few things. So now with the horses tied, I want to go show you a couple things. Off to our right, we have a bunch more trees that we're going to cut. You can see the yellow marks on them. But this trail right here is a pretty neat story behind this trail. It's not obvious right here, but just a little ways farther it is. As I was driving up this morning, I thought of a whole bunch of things I wanted to tell you guys. And just the way my, my mind works, I uh, getting up here and realizing, I hope I can remember some of the stuff I wanted to share with you guys. I didn't log yesterday, but on Monday, I was here and had two students that came in. So every time these students come, there's 19 students in this class, and we hope to get them all through a short stretch of time working with me. And uh, on Monday, they came with their first two students, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And John, the instructor, he came with them. and. So between the two of us, we're kind of showing how horse logging is working for, for us here. But I wanted to show you, and I even will ask John more about it when he gets here if I think of it, 
but I could easily forget. But this road right here, and it is an obvious road, you can see how that is kind of sunk down right there. Well, this is what John told me the other day. It was a military um, road from way back and, it's, and it actually got built back in the 1800s. So this was a military road from back before any um, motorized vehicles were operating, at, at least in conditions like this. Um, I'm not sure exactly when in the 1800s, but uh, anyways, as you can see also off to our right, there is a road down there, which is the main road of today. So this road here would have been done and, and the only thing that would have been traveling on this road would have been horses and maybe some oxen, but it was a military road. And I don't know, it just, it's just kind of neat that I'm up logging here and I'm actually on an old road from the 1800s that horses would have been traveling and I'm traveling it now in 2024 with horses also. I don't know, it's just, maybe it's just me, but that's just a kind, a kind of a neat situation. Right here, back to logging, we have two trees right down here. This is in the back corner of this log job. And there is a power line really, really close to this one tree right here, as you can see. And there's, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six lines going on that power line. And I'm no electrician, I'm no line man, so I don't know how um, important those lines are, but I just can't imagine them not being important. And so um, I told John the Forester that I am not gonna cut these two trees right here, especially that one right there, because it's just too close to the power line. Now, there is very little risk of it going backwards. The tree is actually leaning into the woods area. And so also this one here, we, we think we can get down all right. But I just told the forester, I'm not willing to take the risk of having something go wrong and having it break off and go back over onto those wires. So we're kind of going to do that together. And uh, I guess I'm just putting the responsibility on him to do this just because he works for the college and all. And uh, I just, I'm just, I guess I've been in the logging business for so long. I've seen so many things go wrong that there's just always a risk. And it's just, sometimes it's just not worth the risk. So that's what we're dealing with that. And I might get a tree or two out before they get here this morning. But I kind of wanted to share a couple stories with you this morning about logging. So this morning on my way up here, I had to get some gas. So I stopped at the gas station, which was right on the road. And a guy pulls in with his truck to get gas and we were chatting away. And he was kind of complaining about the weather because there was no snow this year. And I said, boy, I'm not complaining about that. I love it this way. I, I'm a logger. So he went on to some other logging stories that I want to share with you guys. But the reason I love logging in this type of weather that we've been having this winter with no snow is we have had enough snow up here to make for a good trail. But it's amazing how much easier it is to deal with just this, you know, six inches of snow. Um, as opposed to two feet of snow, four feet of snow. Um, when you get that deep snow, it's just a lot of extra work. So I'm very thankful that we have, we're having a semi-mild winter and yet I'm still able to work. So many places, so many people having a mild winter just like I am, but they're in ground conditions that they can't work. They may be out in a swamp but they can't freeze. Just wet ground in general, they just can't freeze so they can't log. So it makes it very difficult. So I'm so thankful that I have this job that I can work on because with the weather we've been having, it is definitely, could be tough for some guys. So anyways, this guy and I were talking about logging. He said his father used to be a logger and he was talking about how, um, the fact that 
or well, uh, the stories that his father used to tell him about using skitters, but he still was actually taking skitters across rivers and swamps and ponds. And it, those winters that weren't quite cold enough, the troubles that they got into, they were actually losing skitters going through the ice. And it reminded me of a story that I read years ago of a, a man that was in logging, a logging camp and he finally got promoted to use horses. And he was so proud and so proud of the fact that he was able to use horses and he just loved his horses so much he was just 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 really loved the job well anyways he had to cross this pond and towards spring towards the end of winter he the ice was getting kind of questionable and sure enough he had a whole lot of logs go across this pond and didn't he go through that pond well he had such a love for his horses he actually dove down into the pond and attempted to unhitch his horses to free them from the harness and from the sled so that they might be able to swim out of the situation that they were in and it did not do it he perished along with his horses down in that cold icy water so there's one story and then this guy um, that i was talking to at the gas station he told me this other story which i thought was really neat so not too far from here there's a a swamp and I think I got this right. I think it's called Mud Pond Swamp. No, no, no. I did it right. Black Pond Swamp. And um, so, anyways, there's quicksand there. Now, this was new to me. I didn't think there was any quicksand up here in the North Country. Um, but he says, oh, absolutely there is. And um, it was in that swamp. And he was... <laughs> he actually told me several stories about people getting having troubles with that swamp but he told me this one story after i told him i was a horse log and I, I was very cautious about going across ponds because it's just those stories that i've heard before i just don't want them to have it happen to me and uh, so he was saying that he remembered a story of this place where the quicksand was and there was a guy with a horse pair of horses logging and i find this story maybe a, i don't know I suppose it's true. I have no guarantees. That's, a, that's the thing about stories with so many people. Um, the stories kind of get stretched a little bit from year to year. And this would have happened a long time ago. Anyways, apparently he was going across this swamp and he hit this quicksand and his horses were going down. And he was, un he was able to unhitch one of the horses and get them out of the quicksand. But the other horse he couldn't get out and he was sinking and sinking. And then he, so he quick ran back, I'm assuming to his truck or to his camp, whatever, and grabbed his gun. And according to this guy here, he, by the time he got back, basically just his head was showing. And, and so he shot the poor horse before it suffered any more. And as it went down into the quicksand. I don't know if that's his true story. It seems a little bit wow to me, but I must tell you that I have been in a, a some swamps where I've had issues slightly like that but nowhere near severe. Um, I've had horses go through quite often in a swamp I would like to try to get across a particular area at night my last hitch of the night and bring out a small hitch so that overnight it would freeze really good so the next day it would be good traveling and I remember several different times in that particular swamp where I was going through that section and the horses were sinking right down into down to their knees in this mud and muck and it surely wasn't quicksand I'm sure but it was just terrible muck and I've had them fall down in that muck and they can't get up so you got to unhitch the horse that's standing hopefully at least one of them standing get them out of the way and get the car out of the way so that this horse can get up um, and it is very difficult when a horse goes down in areas like that where you've got, you know, two or three or four feet even down to the knees in mud to be able to get up. A horse will give up so fast when they're in those situations and just not even try. Uh, I think back to a video I had um, a couple years ago now where I had lady was in the field pulling with two of the horses, uh, the perch runs, I guess, pulling a tractor out and she went down and I can remember 
it was actually a little bit difficult even getting her up and that's that mud was nothing like the mud I was dealing with out in those swamps but uh, anyways those are kind of jobs I, I try to avoid as much as possible but they do come up sometimes but anyways I've run my mouth enough here I gotta get to work it's a little bit cold staying around and I gotta get to cutting some trees down
Moved. Well, our student is here for the day, so or the morning. So let's go see them and John. We have one little tree right here, very little, that I left in the trail to pick up when I come by with a bigger load. Okay, so here we are with John. John is the head forester here at Boston's College. Yep. And I'm gonna have you talk a little bit later on as to, and, and even promote the college a little bit, but let's go to our student first. So um, here's Tenzin. Yep. Uh, unusual name and uh, he's already a friend of mine because he's from Vermont uh, <laughs> actually fairly close to where I'm from so he had uh, troubles with his chain here in bar so he's just getting that back together he just dropped this tree and so he's in the process with John's help to learn more about cutting trees down and he told me earlier he said he's already worked with the skitter um, logging crew here at the college and so, you know, I, I was telling John earlier and, and Tenzin earlier that I'm so glad that these young students are coming out, they're wannabe foresters, to learn about the logging end of things because so often, uh, so often loggers really don't have a good relationship with foresters because they're seeing things that, that they're realizing that they don't know how to log so it makes it difficult to be a good forester if you don't know how to log. Fortunately for John, he's actually done a, a bunch of logging so that makes him a be better forester right from the get-go. And uh, so I'm so pleased that these guys are here so that they can learn a little bit about logging as they continue through with their classes and learn more to be a, a, more about being a forester because there's so many things you can't learn from books and you can't learn from just learning how to do forestry without learning a little bit about logging. All right, John. There's even some things you can't learn from YouTube videos. <laughs> there's a lot of things about YouTube videos that are so incorrect. I'm not always right, that's for sure. So, John is helping um, with explaining how to do the cutting stuff, because there's one thing I actually lack myself, the cutting into things, so I'm actually going over and snooping around and listening to John even as he explains to the students the proper way, uh, in his mind, of cutting trees. And I'm not saying he's wrong, I'm, I'm not saying he's right. It's just the way with all of us, we all have slightly different ways of doing things, and that's okay but we can all learn from each other. So, we'll get this tree um, marked up and I will come in here and get this one out of here to go along with that little one that I have. We have a trail right there that we're gonna take this through. And here's another thing about horse logging, John, that you you probably have never heard of or even had even crossed your mind. Um, growing up in a with horse logging, um, my father was a very stickler about Limbs in the trees, especially in spruce and balsam, more so spruce. Spruce is a lot tougher limbs than the balsams, but he was always concerned, and that's one of the purposes of the blinders on horses' bridles. But he was always concerned about horses swinging their heads over here, and you might have limbed this tree, but you had these big old pointers out here. And he was always concerned and very fussy, make sure you limb them clean, or don't limb them at all, or limb them clean because a branch like this is actually safer somewhat than something like this because they'll swing around and they have the potential of taking an eye out and it's back years ago it wasn't extremely common but it definitely happened so something you don't think about with skid and that's for sure so okay i will get turned around and back right in here we'll go with a 16 here and before you drop it I'll, we'll put a shade on it. Okay. Okay.
John, I'm curious. Yep. Um, do you teach rolling hitches in school? You know, or chain work? I don't know. I'm not part of that you, the logging yeah. classes. Air. I'm not sure how far they get into it. Yeah, There's AJ and Alex are the ones yeah. who would be. Um, I don't know so, uh, how, how far they get. Have you heard about rolling hitches? Do you, do you, do you we do don't really do that because we, we mostly use the uh, grapple skitter. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, get started working with the, the 440, the cable skater. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so I want to explain a few things there. Okay. So, what we're dealing with is a, all we're taking out for right now is just this first 16 foot log. So, it's, we want to get the chains on first, okay? So, when we're, this is going to swing, and then it's going to go that way. So, we need to have the hook this way. So most of the, because it's going to pull like that when okay. it gets straightened up. Uh -huh. um, in a way, it seemed like the right way you had it because you're kind of headed this way with it. Uh -huh. And you're holding, you're hitching onto this end of it, which is not the way it should be. But by the time it spins around, it's going to be pulling like that. Gotcha, yeah. So I, I like to have my chains about that far back, more or less. If you're too close, we especially have a spot on the trail now where it's going over deadfall and then it shoots. And the other day, I lost a whole bunch of them right there. So I've been doing different things to uh, hopefully eliminate that. So anyways, I want to have a little bit of a roll. So I'll put that hook down there. And then I'll hitch on. And we'll spin this out of there a little ways with a fairly long chain. And then I'll shorten it back up again. So this one here, go ahead and put that on. That would be kind of just the opposite. I think that will be quite stop right there, doesn't it? That, uh, two sixteens. Two sixteens to the fork. Oh, there is material it. above it. Yeah. And we haven't we haven't measured out and figured. Okay, that so this yet. this is going to be going this way. So right, get that hook the right way. Yep. And spin it over there. So I, I have a rolling hit. Now, when you're dealing with a skitter, you have so much power that you can do pretty well whatever you want and not worry about things. But with horses. Since you're lacking with power, you've got to be, you know, conscious. Think about this all the time. So one reason for put the, a big reason for putting the rolling hitch on almost every piece is to spin those limbs that we didn't get underneath. Because okay. you'll, yep. especially fine, you almost always miss limbs. Uh -huh. And that's okay. You flip them up with the rolling hitch and you cut them after they're up. If you don't cut them and wait till the landing, at least they're sticking in the air and they're not going to get stubbed up like that. So um, you can get this cut off. And after I get out of here, you can cut this so that this piece here will swing better. It's not, still not going to swing. Um, change of plans. So I'm always looking and thinking and figure out how things are coming out of here. And I'm looking at this, realizing this, this tree here will come out, this log, no problem at all. But that piece there is going to be a, probably a 16 footer. Is that right, John? It is, yep. And then, but there's another piece up in the top. Well, the 16 foot will come out no problem, but the other piece in the top will definitely cause trouble spinning around here, I think. Although it might it, not. It's, it's not going to, I mean, if you'd like, we could go measure it up and see how far it is, but it doesn't go all that Too far. Too far. Yeah. Maybe we're all right. If this is gone, let's try it. So cut this like we were original. Player. Cut that off. I'll come back, have that all ready to go, and I'll snake even the junk piece in between, yep. and we'll take it all at one piece. All right. And I bet it will swing around this corner. Grab your saw tens in, it right there. Come back. I didn't see that coming. Okay. So, we're doing a situation like this. That tree has to actually come backwards. 
And if there's nothing there to stop it, it only needs like an inch or two, it should be fine. Come on, look. come on through. What I do is I get that hook really low. Go in front of my log like that. Okay. Sure horse with the one on with this one over here. Mm -hmm. So much of the work I do is do by voice. So I would just walk over there and it's time to go. Uh -huh. no. With a four-year-old young one, I have to drive. Yeah. Um, so be more careful. Okay, I've got that on the log, but I'll leave it. I'll just drop it and I'll come right back. So this got cut off. Or did you cut? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Uh, Yep, if we could cut this out of the way. Yep. We'll take the heart and kind of put it out there. This would be actually better. I can come in here and turn around. Yep. I can back into there. You need this. That way we can leave that junk in the woods and yep. just get a last log. Yep. Grab them both together. So we'll cut this off, measure up, find out what the log is. Do you need this out of the way? Uh, yeah, it'd be easier. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tend to keep limbing this up, get the ones we missed. Yep. Um, and then we'll get started lopping off the crookedy part right where the top log straightens out. Um, I'll clean this up a little bit and catch it. And then Jim just confirms if you feel good about putting that tree right in this same hole here. Hey, John has something to 
to show me and explain, which is good. That's what I like to have. Because Jim and I have been arguing for a little while, and at one point he said he wanted to wring my neck. So, at least to sort of explain what's going on. Not, not seriously, it was just... just. <laughs> or maybe you wanted to, but you wouldn't have. Because <laughs> um, you're a nice guy. Um, part of your frustration, as I understand it, or the confusion, is you're, you're cutting these trees and there's red rod in them, and it's just, you know, the question, why aren't we getting more of this out? Or why did we wait so long for that, to allow that to happen? Well. You know, how we got to this point is a different story. The past is the past, and you can only play the hand that you're dealt. But what we're just just to explain, John has only been working here how many? How long? Three now? years. Three years. So he is new to the school. So, um, but he. So it's always great to have, bring new blood into a situation like this to maybe even prove what they've been doing up to this point. And for this, from the student's perspective, very often out in real life. You come onto a property and you inherit the management from foresters past or even more often from you know landowners and loggers without a forester having been involved without a ton of planning having gone into it um and the the situation that this job was marked to the exercise for the students who marked this with me in the fall was to say what do you do when you come onto a property and you have a landowner who isn't yet sure what their objectives are they don't have very specific goals for the property and so the question is until they figure out what they'd like to do is the only option to just sit on your hands or is there something you can do in terms of silviculture in terms of decisions about what to cut which trees to to keep and leave when to do it how to do it is there something you can do that's actually going to create value for that landowner in spite of the fact that they don't know what they want and in a case like that we'd say the answer is yes there is what you can do is you can buy that landowner more time to make those decisions you can open up more options in the future for that landowner once they figure it out so the goal, if that's the, if that's the aim, the goal is, you know, there's a couple pieces to it. Maintain as much diversity as you can so that you've got options in the future. In this case, mostly pine dominated. That's not a huge component here. Um, focus on forest health, individual tree vigor, so that you've got good, healthy trees that are really thriving. What we're looking for there is a big, wide crown, lots of leaves and foliage, a nice low center of gravity with nice fat, thick trunk, wide spreading roots, so that if in the future one of the things we want to do is try to regenerate naturally using the seed source provided by the trees that we leave, if you have a tree essentially standing out by itself in a position to dump those seeds down and provide a little bit of shelter on the ground, we want to be confident that it's not going to blow over if we leave it, you know, in this wide open condition. Um, if you, if the landowner decides that what they want to do is, is, you know, try to make this forest as much like an old growth forest as we can so that we get trees that look like the ones you were cutting last year, yes. you know, the four footers and stuff, you're not going to get there unless you've got really good healthy trees. So longevity depends on, on individual tree health. Um, and then you want to focus on timber quality. So even if the landowner is, is ambiguous about what their goals are, any goal that they might have in the future uh, that involves active manipulation, that involves intervening, that involves timber harvesting, if the wood that comes out as a byproduct of that work is more valuable because we've selectively favored the better trees today, well, that's just more resources available to serve whatever goals they have then. So if, if all they want is the world's nicest cross-country ski trails, if in the process of putting those trails in, the wood that gets cut is more valuable, that's more resources available for bridges and culverts and grading and Okay, so I apologize guys, my battery died. So we didn't get the rest of that conversation with John, but maybe I can, even over the next couple weeks, maybe get a few more conversations with him. But we're coming back now to this spot that I told you about earlier in the video, and we're gonna try and get these trees down. And John's actually gonna do it. Hey John, before you start, I was telling people about this road, how neat it was, the fact that I'm traveling on this old military road for the horses just like years ago it would have been done with horses so what was the date that that and what is this called again called the old military road okay and there's a lot of old military roads around right. here um but when did you think the, it was made uh, i think they started building it in 1814 Okay. Up out of Westport up to Hopkinton, the Northwest Bay Road. Okay. And it came up through the high peaks in like Cascade, up over the mountain that way through Lake Plat, what's now Lake Placid, North Elba. And that stretch of road is called the Old Military Road in Lake Placid. Um, and then it runs through here. So when this was actually constructed, probably several years later. So the purpose of the military road at that time was during 
what time frame? So this is just after the, or maybe it got planned during the War of 1812, okay. right? So, I mean, we started that war. We went up and invaded Canada, and the British, who, you know, Canada was British, and they started fighting back. 1814 was the Battle of Plattsburgh, uh, when the British started marching down through the Champlain Valley. They got stopped in Plattsburgh and, and turned back. But at the time, this was something of a contested frontier, and we had our eyes on Canada, thought that would be a nice thing to take over, and they had their eyes on, you know, maybe sowing a little bit of havoc in this, this new republic and coming back. So the main kind of travel corridors at that time were the Champlain Valley, kind of going down through Lake Champlain, Lake George, down to the Hudson Valley, and the St. Lawrence. Uh, and so to have the ability to move soldiers and personnel and, you know, supplies, directly to kind of cut the corner from the Champlain Valley up to the St. Lawrence Valley would have been, you know, a tactical advantage. That if the British started marching on Ogdensburg, you could shuffle all your troops out of Fort Ticonderoga, run up the Champlain Valley, and then cut across this way. So the U.S. Army was building roads, um, and that's where we have the Fort Kent to Hopkinton Road, the Old Northwest Bay Road uh, around in Clinton County, the yeah. military turnpike, 190. As I listen to you, John, I can clearly see you really enjoy history because <laughs> you study it a lot. I guess so. I mean, again, it's like one of the fun things about being a forester is, you know, we've got a road that was built 210 years ago. Uh, and we've got trees that grew up following the, the big fire of 1903. I'll, I'll have her explain that sometime. Yep. And we're doing work now, setting the stage for what's gonna come in 10 or 15 years that's gonna regenerate trees that we expect to be here for another 110 years after that. So we're, we're straddling about 350 years of history in the work that we're doing right here today. Right, right. And that's that's part of the privileges of being a forest. And that's pretty neat. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Hey, I got another quick question for you. Yep. So, um, so I was talking to a guy at a gas station this morning, I, was, I shared it earlier in the video. He was telling me about some swamps, I think he called it the mud, something swamp i can't remember now and i think he thought it was in lake clear and how they have quicksand have you ever heard of quicksand in our area <sighs> sounds like the type of thing you'd hear about from a guy at a gas station <laughs> i don't know like i said earlier <laughs> about stories <laughs> but anyways it's a great story yep uh, i don't you know i wouldn't dispute it unless i knew for sure it wasn't yeah. true and it's hard to prove a negative but right, um right. Okay. I've never gotten sucked down into any quick sand around here. Yeah. Plenty of sand, just the slow variety, you know? Um, okay, I'll let you put these trees down. Okay. okay. Ooh, do we want this stuff chopped up first? No. 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 Just plop it right down on top of there. But you're going you're gonna to get on the left-hand side of this little big tree. That's the plan, right? No. Th this one here is going first down in there, right? Can do. Or do yep. No, we did talk, talk about putting it down right well, down the road. You've been saying. Yeah. No, if you can there. do that. Um, With all those big branches, though. Probably going to. Yeah, I think. What were we thinking? At one point, we were talking about going that way, I looked way at all too. the options. I, I think my preference was going to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. We said we wanted to keep it up there, yeah, but, didn't we? Yeah, I can get it out through there. If you yeah. can put it out through there, no Let's problem. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's stick okay. that. Okay. Just real quick, I mean, it's a, it's a funky tree. There's, you know, probably, we're gonna have to lop it off there to get started anyway. Part of what makes this situation tricky, a little bit of back lean and a little bit of side lean. 
against the direction that we're trying to put the tree. So we're going to use two wedges and each wedge, you know, they're kind of both on the same theme, pulling in the same direction, but they have slightly different jobs. First wedge that we set fairly close to the hinge and we're going to drive that in. You can hear it's pretty nice and solid right there. And we're using that for support to take some of the weight of the tree as it's leaning up off to the side off of the the hinge on this side but really more to the point to relieve some of the tension on the opposite side of the hinge so that it doesn't pull out as it wants to tip that way and then we'll put in a second wedge um, in the back more towards the back and this this is going to be more that we use for lift to actually help push it over so maybe the case that once we once we let it go there's enough kind of push coming from the wedges we put in that it tips right over but if not we'll work the wedges in we'll use this wedge to do the lift and then just keep kind of enough pressure on that so that it relieves the hinge on the other side john is so much better at explaining than i am so that's great We had that real solid kathunk, but now as you take up some of the weight, start pushing, now that gives a little bit because there's we're lifting it up and some of the tension's coming off it. So we want to keep the pressure on up here. Now we've got that kathunk. We're not going to push hard. We don't have a ton of leverage on this wedge. We'll keep working from the back, taking up some of that pressure. You can see this opening up a little bit. We're going to start tipping it. But as it does, we want to keep keep this tight. And if you had just one wedge in there, it's possible that you wouldn't be able to push it, but by having two, it's really nice to go back and forth, back and forth, correct? Yep, and it's this, this back one that we're using to do most of, again, the lifting. If we needed to, we could put one straight in the back to get maximum leverage, or even two stacked up. And again, this one's here mostly for support. You hear that solid thunk, right? Keeping it uh, fully engaged. The spot where I'd be tempted to slip a third wedge, it, wedge in there. It might run and grab me to holler to him. He's not running the street, so. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So John's gonna run back and get a third wedge just to make sure. We have a little situation because of the wires off to our right here that we want to be very careful and make sure we do this and do it right so we don't lose that tree. What always concerns me in situations like this is to have that the hinge on the further side break off and then go bad. But uh, we should be fine here, hopefully. But the suspense, the suspense of it all, eh? I was just saying how, and this does concern me, you know, as you're working, I know what you're doing and, and that's great, but there's still always that chance of this hinge on this side breaking off. Yep. And then it's gonna fall right on the wires. And that's why you don't wanna put too much on this near side. Right. You know, to actually try to lift it from there, because then if for a tree that wants to sit back, it could actually pop and go backwards. Right. So do all the lifting from behind and just use that to relieve the pressure yep. and keep that side strong. Yep. Let me grab that extra wedge for you. We've got a tricky tree here we're trying to finagle down. <laughs> Trying to wedge it over that way. Yeah, he wants to put right down to there. Gotcha. And it wants to come back this way yeah, yeah, towards that. the wires. <laughs> but as long as his hinge holds, he's going to get it. Hey, I do have another wedge down the truck. Okay. Uh, feels like we got to be getting pretty close here. Um, 
Tell you what, why not have... Yeah, I can run and grab the no, wedge. No, you can hold the camera. Oh. Or that. And, and then in case it goes, it goes. And, and if I don't get back in time, okay? Want two? You want one? Uh, go ahead and bring two. Okay. Yep, perfect. It's not, at this point, it doesn't have a ton of back clean. Uh -huh. Basically straightened it out. But you can see from here, if the branches are tangled up in, in this guy. Yeah. You know? Actually, this is what we were just talking about in class yesterday. You know, just an, an ugly but interesting tree. Mm -hmm. It's actually nice to kind of have around in the mix in here, just from a, just from having something something of interest to look at. But it's it's mostly now that those branches are just sort of tangled up. Put enough lift on it, it'll it'll tip over and sweep through. Should feel pretty good about it. But I wanna just, again play it safe because of where we're sitting, right next to the road and the power lines. Oh yeah, the brown are right there. Yeah. And if this were a you know, machine-operated job, we'd just bring the machine up and put the blade on it and, and push it over. Uh -huh. Or with the tractor, put the bucket, you know, raise the bucket up and just get some push behind it and tip it over. Um, but in this case, not an option, so we need to bring it all the way over and all the way down on our own. Mm -hmm. So now... I can talk, I'm still huffing and puffing, but so John's tempted to put one wedge on top of the other one to get more lift. When it's froze, I have found that wedges are more difficult to pound in. As you can see, John is just kind of tapping them. If he was to haul off and hit him really hard, they would just fly right out of there. Exactly. <laughs> so you gotta, when it's cold like this, you gotta tap. portion of this out because it's just taking so long but that's that's exactly what happens sometimes in the woods you're just dealing with these situations and and it takes quite a while sometimes now here's one big disadvantage of having horses if you had a big piece of equipment a skitter and whatnot they would just come in here with the blade and push it right over but uh, we don't have it so we have to deal with it the best way we can. I have also noticed over the years when it's cold in the wintertime the branches that it may be leaning into on other trees and or its own branches don't have the flex to them as to when they're cold when they're I mean as it, when they're warm when they're warm they'll bend easier when they're cold they'll break easier but if you're in the, the stage when you're just barely moving you would prefer them to bend to let so they let go. That's a stinker. So did you grow up horse hunting, Jim? Yes. Okay. So that's how you got into it. Yeah. My father taught me. So you've been cool. doing it since then. I've been logging. Uh, what was it now? Try to think. Well, I started logging in 1978. Okay. And I haven't missed that's a winter. About, that's about when my dad was born. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't missed a winter of horse logging in all those years. At least a partial winter. Mm -hmm. So what, what gave you the desire to be a potential forester? Well... I decided over COVID that I didn't like being inside. You know, I was cooped up for too long. I was like, I want to do something where I can be outside and I care about the environment and the future of the planet. So I decided to go into forestry. It also helped that we own about 60 acres in Vermont and we uh, were enrolled in like active use, uh, you know, 
stuff like that. And we have a management plan and we, we actually log all our own woodlands for firewood. So do you have a forester that works with woodland? Yes, yeah, so we work with Dan Healy from Longview. Okay, I don't He's know. really good. Yep. Um, they're a great company. A little shout out there. For so them. was was he a little bit of an inspiration for Absolutely, you? Absolutely, actually. So when I was deciding what I wanted to do in college, I reached out to him and I was like, hey, do you mind if I shadow you for a day and see what it is that you do? And so he took me out and I was like, man, this is great. I get to like, you know, it was just so cool to me, like being able to read the landscape and be like, this used to be a meadow and X, Y, and Z and stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he was really what helped me decide that and my upbringing with like working in the woods a little bit, mm -hmm. but mostly Dan and Longview, yeah. Well, that, that's great. We're seeing more movement at the top. I saw one branch let go up there. I know, I've been <laughs> seeing a bunch. I know. I'm telling you, if it was 20 degrees warmer, or even 10 degrees warmer, that would have gone down by now. I'm very convinced of that. Just because they'd be so much more flexible. Mm -hmm. Wow. You think about it, they're frozen now. So yeah. they're just, they're frozen, mm -hmm. and they won't give. So have you gone through all the game, lo game of logging courses? Only levels one and two. Okay. That's what we do over our uh, summer session. Right. And that's when they teach us how to run the skidder, the log loader, all that fun stuff. Okay. We were actually right up the road uh, cutting pine over the summer. Okay. Well, John, you got it down. Better you than me. Yeah. I bet you sleep tonight with all that pounding you did. Those axes, they just wipe me out as much as anything. I know. I like I said what, Monday or whatever. I feel like I'm getting professor arms. <laughs> Come out and work with you for a little bit. I'm all worn out. <laughs> okay, guys, we're back here after lunch, and our student has left along with John, the instructor. And as you can see, we're right here. So we had this tree that we fought so bad with and uh, I have Baron and Bill ready to pull this tree out and I could have and I'm sure I will end up throwing away a good 10 feet of that and I marked it up to a little ways for a I think it's um, let's see, uh, 16 of 14 and, or 16 and 2 14, I don't know what it was but anyways, um, we're going to leave this piece right on and see if we can't skid this up out of here. And then I'll cut that butt there probably off and roll off the trail and go out with the, with the team and the, the rest of this hitch. Okay, I'm sure this will work out fine, but what we have right here is a, we got pinched between this stump and that tree down there, but at least we got out of that hole. See, we were a little bit concerned of having the logs and or trees drop down into that big old hole, which fortunately did not happen. And so I think we can actually cut the log, that uh, stub at the butt right off and then hitch on to where the good log starts. And we should be able to snip this right out of here, no problem.
Okay guys, this is the last part of this video and I know it's another long video and I know it's probably way, way, way too long for a lot, a lot of people but I think the bulk of the people that watch my videos are retired people that really are like to reminisce of years gone by um, but I also, if anyone's still watching that's starting out with horses, I would like to say even though these are awful long videos, there's a lot of stuff in these videos that you could learn from to help you in your journey of getting horses and doing some of the stuff that I do. Um, I really would like that if uh, you were to even comment in the video and saying, you know, are you watching my videos because it's um, more of a reminiscing type of thing? Um, or are you a new person wanting to learn about horses and driving and working horses? So we have one more hitch to hitch onto. We'll get hitched on this and we'll call it a day or at least a video. Um, the day is not done. Um, you guys have a great day. If you like these videos, subscribe and like and all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. I know I anybody that's watched this video all the way to the end probably is already subscribed. 
Um, and I know I'm supposed to put the tell people to subscribe at the start of the video, but oh well. I'm not really co so concerned, except for the fact that those guys that really want to continue watching my videos, if you are subscribed, you'll be notified. So anyways, you guys have a great day. We'll see you next time.